Well, here we are, uh, the morning after David's amazing preach last night, and very sadly, there was a technical malfunction last night, and so the sermon didn't record. But David, hugely, hugely graciously, has been willing, um, after celebrating his... uh, doctorate being submitted last night. Uh, We had a great time last night. Uh, We've had breakfast and here we are now and he's willing to uh, just have a bit of a a chat, the two of us, um, just to uh, talk through basically some of the stuff uh, that he preached on last night uh, so that you can hear exactly what happened even though the recording failed. So I'm going to pray and then uh, we're going to kick off David, okay? Great. Uh, Lord God, we thank you uh, that the machine's now working. Uh, We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for David. And we pray um, that you would guide us by your spirit as uh, we talk together now. Uh, Lord, please um, just be in our conversation. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, first of all, David, thank you for doing this. Of course, uh, my pleasure. Um, this just, happens. It does happen. <laughs> and you know what? You did give me champagne last night. I did. So, you know, yeah. you know fair, fair game. <laughs> good, 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 good. We'll give you some more champagne if you want. Um, uh, you said yesterday, you said uh, yesterday, you talked about you really honored to, to speaking here, mm-hmm. HDC, because of the history and things. Just, just share something of that to begin with. Yeah, so last night I was just really overcome by the sense that, um, you know, this is the place where William... Wilberforce uh, received the inspiration to abolish slavery. And what was, is so fascinating about him is that the reason that he did that was because of the authority of Scripture, not in, in spite of it. Yeah. And we are seeing right now the total reversal of the Reformation that said that Scripture is the ultimate authority, not just a authority, or something I can pull bits out of pages and construct what I like, but actually the authority for how we're to live and what defines our sexual ethics, our you know, social ethics. And so I stand on you know, the shoulders of Wilberforce who, and the reformers in Oxford. And I felt this week with the General Synod, you know, as a celibate gay man, that, that the, the, the candle that Latimer and Ridley and Cramner and know the reformers lit grew really dim yeah but I believe that there's another way forward that's actually the real radical kingdom way forward and I'm going to talk about that radical holiness and that radical inclusion and how we're called to live in the tension not to resolve the tension yeah and I think that flame is ignited by that tension and what the General Synod has done is to remove that tension mm. and to try to put out that flame. Yeah. But we stand here, I stand here as a witness. And actually the word for witness is martyr, which means martyr. Like yeah. To, yeah. Well. And so I don't think that the Church of England is going to get away with um, this. And I think there will be many martyrs, yeah. <laughs> many witnesses that God sends to it to call it to yeah. repentance, standing on the shoulders of that great tradition, which is true. So Amazing, yeah. amazing. Thank you. And I know we'll come back to the, the idea of radical inclusion and radical holiness, but let's just um, sort of let's just hear a bit about you. Um, just share something of your upbringing, um, what happened for you in terms of growing up before you came to faith in Christ. Yeah, so I grew up in an agnostic atheist home in... Sydney, Australia, which, you know, is one of the gay capitals of the world. I'm also a theologian in residence now in San Francisco one month of the year. So I've got two gay capitals tick (laughs) in my life. Um, And, you know, growing up in in Sydney, Australia, I went to a Christian school. My parents were agnostics um, with some kind of loose Christian background, but didn't believe. And, um, you know, I was brought up with the idea that faith was kind of rationally a bit ridiculous. And how could people especially evangelical yeah. faith. And so, um, you know, growing up in a Christian school, for me, I very much imbibed this kind of message that God had allowed me to have these desires, did, would do nothing to change them, and then condemn me for them, which yeah. made absolutely no sense yeah. as a gay person. I was actually the first gay person to ever come out in my school. Wow. And so I've always been a little bit of a... Yo, trailblazer. Trailblazer, a bit of an activist. <laughs> um, and so, 
um, in me, this kind of identity as a gay activist started to form, yeah. and uh, the wrestle of what it meant to be gay and how that related to Christianity was there. And I resolved that tension by saying, I'm going to destroy the church and yep. destroy Christianity. And I had this very profound experience in a park with my Russian Orthodox boyfriend, because, you know, I have alternative taste, <laughs> and his name is Vladimir. Yeah. And, you know, he was a lovely man. It was actually a lovely relationship. And he, he said to me, David, like, I just feel like there's something in you that I can't satisfy, and you're looking for something that I can't give you. Yeah. And so I want to give you this cross as a gift. And so I went on this kind of long-winded attack on Christianity and wow. <laughs> started to get quite um, exasperated with why he would give me a symbol of our oppression as a gift. Yeah. Um, but actually, my boyfriend was evangelizing yeah. me in <laughs> some kind of sense, <laughs> even back then. And so, but because I was controlled by self-rejection, um, and I think this is something we don't understand about our hamartiology or yeah. our doctrine of sin, that actually at the base of sin is it rebellion of God from God, that is actually a symptom. Yep. But there is this deep belief that I am rejected. And Henry yep. Nouwen says that the greatest enemy of the spiritual life uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is actually self-rejection yep. because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Yep. Yep. And that being the beloved constitutes the core truth of our existence. And so... I think I was controlled, and I think a lot of that gay activistic guile that we've seen in General Synod, that we see in the secular media, comes from a deep sense that I'm rejected. Yeah. And yeah. so I have to actually, um, I have to actually reject who God is and edit who God is. Yeah. But also the church at the time very much felt like the friends of Job. Yeah. And, you know, if you read that text, the friends of Job just have these horrible explanations for like why they're suffering and why Job is suffering and they're all totally wrong and in the end God just rebukes them all yeah. and they're kind of dismissed <laughs> uh, and by, by the eventual vindication of God for Job which is amazing and I think there's a sense in which God I didn't know that instead of being a friend of Job that God actually became Job with us yeah. and came and suffered alongside us. And I think as, a, as the LGBTQI plus community, what I didn't know is that that's actually what God has done in Christ yeah. for us, that he's come into the mystery of sexuality. And I think it's so important to understand that sexuality is not just an ethical issue. We've over-moralized yeah. and under-theodicized, under, you know, we've made it not enough about mystery yeah. and enough about the mystery of suffering and that we don't get the choice to suffer, but we get the choice to who, who we suffer to and for. Yeah. And I think what God did in Christ by becoming a human being is absolutely the anchor of how we need to approach um, human sexuality and gender. But I didn't know all that, and I, hadn't, I didn't have access to grace, so I ended up becoming a French existentialist and a Wiccan witch, and became a Buddhist and a reformed Jew for a week and um, <laughs> just tried, like, tried it all, you know? Yeah. That is incredible. <laughs> so went all the way there. <laughs> um, <laughs> you tried it all. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to a gay liberal church. Yes, but I say. And really, I was like, yeah. nah, this just doesn't work. Yeah. Like, and then, and then talk, talk, talk to us about yeah. the time when you're with your uncle. Yeah, so, so then came out of that and whole quagmire of questioning and spirituality as a young person and... Um, I ended up at a, a club in the gay quarter of Sydney and I wrote in my journal the question like, what is love? And I was very engaged in kind of left-wing politics and activism at university. I mean, I was woke before woke was woke. You know, they didn't have that term then, you know. I think it's important to say that like woke, its original meaning in the black community is a good thing. Yeah, but, awakening. You know, yeah. yeah, awakening, but that yeah, I was, I was definitely in that camp. Yeah. And, um, Head of the curve. Yeah, Head of the curve, that's right. <laughs> Um, <laughs> trailblazer. Um, and so um, I wrote this question, what is love, and handed it around the club to, you know, the intelligentsia of, of Sydney's Labour Party. And, you know, I got what is love, baby, don't hurt me, and <laughs> just all sorts of trite responses. Yep. And I was in the taxi, and I just remember, like, reading these responses and this kind of exhaustion, yeah. this kind of, of just the secular ideal of love just cracking. Yeah. 
And I think that's when the Holy Spirit start, really started to work right back then, um, having that like Ecclesiastes moment yeah. where there's nothing new under the sun. And so then I ended up at Christmas lunch table 2008 and my Pentecostal lawyer uncle who was like my absolute cultural enemy and I was ready to like intellectually assassinate at yeah. any point um, just mentioned God and so then I went on a very similar <laughs> rampage against Christianity that you know I did with my boyfriend only far more sophisticated yeah. this time and I said um, you know there's there's no such thing as absolute truth you can't even communicate truth with language let alone talk about God it's ridiculous and he said well the problem with that is you just said there's no absolute truth and that's an absolute truth and you just con doubly yeah. contradicted yourself. And so I stormed out of the room theatrically and just <laughs> said, well, I'm queer, so I win. And, you know, and um, he said this thing to me that is actually quite profound. He said, well, David, the truth is a person, not a concept in my head. And that's, that's the mistake you're making with your, wow. with your critique of Christianity. And I actually really loved that response, but I couldn't. I obviously had to hide that <laughs> I did. I'm not telling yeah. you that. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, then as I was kind of leaving the room, my uncle had a vision, prophetic word of me um, being baptized with the Holy Spirit in three months' time. And so my mom had become a Christian, and I also was estranged from her because of it, and used to spend all my time out of the house. Yeah. And, um, and so she heard about the word, started to pray with my aunt. And then three months later, I ended up in a pub in the gay quarter of Sydney, um, March 2009, with a young filmmaker. And just Audrey Hepburn-esque kind of look. Uh, and no way in a million years would I have thought she was a Christian. Yeah. Like, she's not what I associated yes. with a Christian. Yeah. And, and she... She proceeded to, well, she got her film into the largest short film competition in the world as a finalist, and so I had this sense that there was something going on there yeah. that was pretty incredible. So I asked her, how did this happen? And she said, do you want the real answer? I said, of course. And she said, well, it was God. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> That's not the answer I want. <laughs> you know, and so she starts to ask me about what I think about Jesus and faith, and I said, look, I've read... 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and Romans 1, which we're going to talk about yep. later, which becomes, becomes some of my favorite yep. passages. And I just know that, like, your God's not interested in me. And that, like, self-rejection response, yep. that God couldn't love me. Yep. And that, you know, that sense of rejection. And so um, she starts to be like, she says, like, David, I don't really understand that. That must be so hard. I, I don't even know. But um, I, just, I have this question for you. Have you experienced the love of God, and that question just pierced right through <laughs> all my defenses, and it went to that place of self-rejection. It went to that deeper place um, where we believe God couldn't love us because of some extrinsic factor, and so she offered me prayer, and um, to my own like amazement, I said yes, <laughs> uh, and then she started praying for me, and it wasn't like a seeker-sensitive prayer. It was full like full-on Pentecostal book of Revelation yeah. being cited at certain points. <laughs> you know, the enemy being vanquished, the yeah. blood of Jesus. You know, <laughs> yeah. imagine I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> what is going on? But I kind of like it. It's intense, wow, spicy, you know. And, so she's like, and I'm obviously a postmodern, so it's like experience, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and as she's praying for me, I just like went into this Kairos moment, this time where like, you know, time froze a bit like the Matrix. And um, I just felt, you know, it says in Scripture, uh, in the Psalms, I've anointed um, my servant David with my sacred oil. And so in this moment, I could just feel the Holy Spirit, like, hovering above my wow. head. And it was, like, the weirdest thing. And I could, it's almost like the Holy Spirit was just so excited to finally know me, yeah. you know. And I think ever since I've become a Christian, the Holy Spirit is, like, my best friend. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I'm a celibate gay Christian, which we're going to go into, is because of him. Yeah. That, like, I've noticed that he's not happy when I'm in yes. a gay relationship. And I think that's really important to say, actually. It's about friendship with the Holy Spirit yeah. Yeah. and what he wants. And that's obviously reflected in Scripture. Yeah. But anyway, so, so this happens, and I just feel um, it's like someone pouring oil over my head, and it went all the way, you know, through my body, and it was the most beautiful 
anointing, like just incredible sense of the presence of God. And I just knew in that moment, like this is what I, I was created for. And then this power went through my legs and then I heard this voice say, do you want me three times? And I said, yes. And then I saw this veil over my heart. Yeah. And then as I kind of said, yes, this pinprick of light. And it says in um, 2 Corinthians, yeah. this verse that talks about there's a veil over their heart. Um, I think we've got that. Yeah, I think that's um, right. You know, th their hearts are covered with veil and they do not understand. But where this, whenever someone turns to the Lord, um, the veil is taken away. And now the Lord is the spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So in this moment, you know, that is exactly happening to me. Yeah, incredible. And it was like this veil being pierced and I could just like breathe without be, you know, breathing and said to her, I'm, I, what's happening to me? And she said, well, you're being born again. Mm. You know, the Holy Spirit loves you. And I just couldn't. So like, I'm not a right wing person. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> born again. You know, like, and so it was quite ironic. Just the whole thing was just like almost oh, like incredible. comedy, you know. And then um, I heard this voice say to me, um, will you accept my son Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I felt this kind of tug of war over my soul for about five minutes yeah. as she was praying. And um, and then suddenly I just said yes. Mm. And then the love of God was poured out on my life. And I was so, like, <laughs> he, I, my body became so hot from yeah. the presence of God that she had to kind of get a flannel and, like, <laughs> wipe you me down. <laughs> it was a full-on, like, baptismal wow. experience of the Holy Spirit. Went home that night. My mom was waiting up, and she said, David, are you okay? You know, <laughs> what's, has something happened? And she knew it was about the three-month mark, so yep. she was waiting. And I was just like, oh, I think I've, um... <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we became, um... <laughs> Christian, you know. And so she starts doing praise laps in the oh. living room. <laughs> like, oh, telling me that she's made time for like a covenant with God, that if God saved me, he's the God of the impossible, yep. and that I was impossible to save. And so if he did, yep. she'd give her whole life to the Lord. And so yep. it was just like almost like a biblical, yeah. you know, Amazing. moment. And so then I went to the film competition and I was really wrestling with this experience and like saying like, I'm definitely a Christian, but this could be wish fulfillment. Yep. And then I looked at a star in the sky and I said, God, I, I need a rational reply. Like I need something that I just know with reason that I can trust because yep. I've got a lot to give up. And so, um, she won the whole film competition. I read, ran down to the red carpet and she was like, David, this whole event is for God's glory. There are angels everywhere. And actually, I didn't know this, but the, the, that, that particular competition was organized by Christians. Okay. And they prayed that God would use it to incredible. save people. So that's totally secular. Yeah. So yeah. it was just an incredible kind of divine conspiracy. Yeah. And <laughs> she just said, you know, all night God's been bugging me to tell you that he exists and you just need to know that. So there was that rational sign. And, and I went to church with her that Sunday and it was the same church as my mum, my aunt and uncle. And there was just this whole divine conspiracy and I just fell in love with God. And Incredible. so I think God fulfilled this deeper longing, this yeah. deeper place. And you know, Augustine talks about until our hearts rest in God, yeah. we'll be restless, you know, and there is, there is nothing else that can fulfill that, vo that void but, but God. And so, yeah, that's how I became a Christian. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, last night you spoke a bit about, that, and you touched on earlier, the sort of radical inclusion mm -hmm. and radical holiness. What, what, what do you mean by those two phrases and how do they fit together? Just say something. Yeah, and uh, so um, if we go to Romans, I think we'll go to Romans 1 to 2. Um, I think one of the things we don't understand about Paul's message is that we often use Romans 1 as a proof text against homosexuality or you know, same-sex acts. Yeah. Yep. But I actually think what Romans 1 to 2 is about is a rhetorical move yeah. from Paul. Yeah. And so in, um, in Paul's time, um, AD 45, Emperor Claudius, there were all the, the Jews in Rome, and um, there was such a kerfuffle yeah. that the emperor was like, right, you guys, get out of Rome. I'm done because they were fighting over yeah. Jesus yeah. and fighting over whether there was this greater righteousness through the Messiah or not. Yeah. And the community of the church would have been totally, uh, you know, a bit like General Synod, <laughs> totally <laughs> divided on that question. Yes. And so Paul's writing into that context, never having been to Rome, but, you know, wanting to 
rebuke one side of yeah. that coin. And um, in Romans 1, you know, he talks about the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all the godless, godlessness and wickedness of people and um, that people knew, you know, God's glory, but they turned away from it and worshipped created things. So God gave them over to desires. And then he yep. talks about same-sex activity yep. Yep. being one of, like, the principal signs of this cosmic drama yep. where people, you know, from Genesis, you know, we there was this turning away from God's word to, to another word. Yep. And um, I think this is his commentary both on the Judaizers who were trying to condemn people with the law. Yeah. So he's using the truth of the law yeah. to defend yes. the Gentiles and to defend gay people yeah. who do these things. So he says in then Romans 2, so we can't yeah. just have Romans 1. Yes. We've got to go. And Romans 1 is yeah. true. Yes. Paul says the law teaches us what sin yep. is. So totally. he's not denying that. Yep. And some theologians have tried to say he's just, just like totally against Romans yes. 1 yeah. because he's trying to say that's the Judaism's yes. argument. No, like the law still stands, the moral truth of the law still stands, it just can't justify us. Yeah. So he says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment, you who pass judgment do the same things. Yeah. In other words, there were lots of Jews yeah. who were gay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there were lots of Jews who yeah. were all the things that yeah. Paul talks about yeah. in that passage. And so he uses the law against the legalists. Yes, exactly. And to protect and defend the justification, yeah. the making right of gay people, mm. LGBTQI plus people, all people yeah. through the greater righteousness of Jesus. And I just think, wow, this yeah. passage that I thought condemned me is actually the yeah. foundation of gay rights. Yeah. Yes. So you have this radical holiness. Mm. The law teaches us what sin is. Yeah. There is this standard in the created order. Marriage is sexually differentiated between a man and a woman and the only place for sexual um, activity. Yeah. And then you have this radical inclusion of the whole world yeah. in Christ. And we have to live in that tension yeah. that Paul passes in this. Yeah. And then he says, all have fallen short of the glory yeah. of God. So gay, straight, yeah. you, you, you can be justified. And then yeah. in receiving that gift of love, you would then inspire desire from the deepest part of you to want to live in a way that pleases God yeah. and actually fulfills the law. Yeah. So you don't fulfill the law yourself. Christ's already done that, but yeah. he, in your obedient living, fulfills the law in your life. So it's done by grace, not by yeah. law. And I just think, what an incredibly radical yeah. message that it's radical holiness, yes. a deeper holiness than even the law itself, yeah. and a even way more radical yeah. inclusion. And yeah. I just think we've lost that message. Yeah. No, and so, I think the general synod has lost that message. So powerful. I love the bit where it has that phrase, that, uh, without excuse, and it's got the, you're without, they're without excuse, the Gentiles in chapter one. Yeah. And then the, the Judeos who think they're so super moral and super perfect, you're without excuse, you who judge, and saying actually all of us need Jesus. It's just um, it's a wonderful then message. And the other thing he says is you blaspheme the name of, of God among the Gentiles. Yeah. So actually it's like the worst place to be in yeah. Paul's yeah. view is actually the one who's trying to stand on the law as righteousness. Yeah. And I think as the conservative church, yeah. we've often slipped into that Correct. fleshly space with the gay community, and that's the jo yeah. Friends of Job problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. you uh, after talking about that, but you then went on and talked about eunuchs yeah. and Isaiah 50, what was it, 54, 56? Um, Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56. Tell us about, what is a eunuch, for those who don't know what a eunuch <laughs> is, um, and, um, and tell us about Isaiah 56. So yeah, eunuchs were a kind of sexual gender minority in the ancient world, and actually, it's quite hard to know exactly what they were, but they were usually defined as people who couldn't procreate because they didn't have the genitalia to do so, but they could have also been people who were queer yep. or just didn't fit in the yep. male-female gender binary. And yep. Some people say to me, oh, I don't know if you can apply this passage exactly, and I said, I think you can apply it at least <laughs> analogously, you yep. know. So I'm happy to use it and insert gay, trans, yes. whatever yep. it might be, yep. um, because they didn't have those categories, but those sure. realities still existed, yep. you know. So it says in, um, and I remember reading this passage actually in Oxford, yep. and it's like I, the Holy Spirit just switched on a light. I was like, oh my gosh, this is 600 years before Jesus came? Yeah. Yeah. And this reveals how radically inclusive God was, even in the Old Testament, yeah. which yeah. people like to deny. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it says, um, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. Yeah. 
And what it shows in that passage is that God promises to give a name to all sexual and gender minorities that obey his commands. Yep. So it's not an undermining of the law. Yep. Keep his Sabbath. Yep. Like I'm doing hopefully after this. Yep. And he then says, I will give them like this greater name that even having kids and getting married. Yeah. And that's not to shirk marriage or say that marriage is not an amazing yeah. calling. It's a beautiful thing. But it is saying there's this other way yes. that um, God opens up in Christ and that actually Christ on the cross becomes a eunuch yep. for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So he doesn't have kids, yep. doesn't procreate, doesn't marry. And so I think that he identifies then. There is something, actually a bodily correspondence between yeah. what we go through as queer people and what Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Yeah. And there's this huge, then you see in Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch yes. being baptized, yeah. <laughs> this kind yeah. of apocalyptic moment yeah. as the fulfillment of that yeah. passage. And then in Revelation, it talks about people who haven't, you know, um, are virgins. Yes. And it says they have a name that no one else has. They have a song that no one else can sing and they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Yeah. And so there's this incredible picture of hope, actually, yes. for queer people that yeah. choose, and it's not necessarily celibacy, I think. Yes. That can be a message that gets a bit twisted, that I'm yes. saying every gay person has to be celibate. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm saying is that every person has to come and wrestle with God in yeah. that tension yeah. of radical holiness and radical yeah. inclusion, and then will find a path of obedience. And that could yeah. be what's called a mixed orientation yeah. marriage with someone of the opposite sex. Yep. Um, so there's lots of people like yep. Sean yep. Doherty and yep. de various friends of mine who've been called to that yes. as they've wrestled. Yep. But they haven't resolved the tension. Yeah, the and tension's then, still there. But exactly. That is that, yeah. And then a lot more, I think, of gay people end up being celibate because yes. that wrestles quite hard. Yes. So it's not easy no. for queer people to accept mm. the fact that their desires are misaligned with the created order. Yep unlike straight people who, yep. even if they lust, mm -hmm. they still can get married. And you see yep. that in 1 Corinthians 7, there's this concession for straight yep. people to get married and gay people, queer people don't have that. Yep. And I think that is a problem pastorally yep. that yep. you know we need to explore as the church and actually do a lot more work on. And so that's why I wrote my doctorate, yes. Queering the Queer, yep. an exploration of yep. how gay celibate asceticism can renew and inform the role of desire in contemporary Anglican theology. So I think, you know, the Anglican Church has admitted they have done enough work on celibacy. Yeah. Yes. And so I just, I think we have such an exciting opportunity to go back to Scripture and see how it is actually a really good word yeah. for LGBTQI plus people. And it's funny, people have said to me, well, do you want the gift of marriage? Mm. And I'm like, I don't know. Mm. I kind of love being celibate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's hard sometimes, yeah. but it's also yeah. just like, really amazing and I yeah. I actually really understand 1 Corinthians yes. where Paul says I wish you were all as I am and yeah. someone said to me last night after I preached they were like I understood that for the first time yeah and my mom even says to me sometimes David darling I'm just a little bit jealous of your calling sometimes I love your father but <laughs> I wouldn't mind being a radical celibate of <laughs> preaching the gospel so you know I think we all just need each other yes. married people celibate people and God has this beautiful picture of 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 that and the city of God of yeah. us all together worshiping around the throne and I just think there's such hope there's such goodness yeah. this is a good word yeah. for LGBTQI plus people and I cannot believe that the very scriptures that I thought condemned me yeah. were actually the scriptures of the foundation of my inclusion and even 1 Corinthians 6 9 mm. which I haven't talked about just quickly yeah. you know it does say if you define your life without yeah. God in the activity of of gay sex yes. it says you will not yep. receive the kingdom of heaven well don't we know that you've got yeah. to be justified by faith first yeah. you know yep. so it's not denying that universal offer of justification mm -hmm. and then paul says but such as some of you were yeah. in other words there are a ton of gay people in the early yes. church yeah <laughs> like a lot of people had been yeah. included in the covenant and actually this is the sign of inclusion totally. the very passage i thought would yeah. mean meant i couldn't be included and so yeah. my i'm praying and hoping people's ears could be opened yeah. to that inclusion that leads to radical holiness yeah, amazing word, amazing word. Just as we sort of wrap up, mm -hmm. um, uh, just, I just want to mention your book, which is yeah. an amazing book, A War of Loves, The Unexpected Story of a Gay Activist Discovering Jesus. Just, um, mm -hmm. uh, just sort of following on from what you just said there, just explain what you're meaning when you say A War of Loves. And, and th th yeah, explain yeah. That. so I wrote A War of Loves because I think what is essentially happening in 
for gay people particularly, as I've just described, is that kind of tension we have to live in, which is quite extreme, mm. of like, which love do I allow to define my life? Like yeah. the love of God or the love of, you know, yeah. my sexual orientation, yeah. love. Yep. And actually, until you experience the love of God, and then that love becomes so much greater in your life and wins the war, if yes. you like, then you can actually understand your sexual orientation and wrap it around the holiness of God. But if you're trying to do that without the love of God, it'll just end up being a clanging symbol. It'll just end up being legalistic yeah. and repressive. So I think a war of loves is this message of let the love of God win over yeah. all your other loves. And then there's also the, the tension of the spirit and the flesh that yeah. Paul talks about, the war yes. between those two yeah. forces of energy, the energy of death yeah. and um, non-faith, yes. and then the energy of faith and life from Christ, and those two fighting over our lives. And even when we're born again Christians, yep. spirit-filled Christians, we're still always going to experience yes. that wrestle. And so it isn't just an easy journey. Your, you know, your gay <laughs> desires go away, your straight yeah. desires go away. Oh yeah. no, sometimes yeah. that war gets intense. Yeah, and sometimes battle. we fail some battles, yeah. but it's okay, there's hope, yeah. and God has the grace to move us on. So that's why I put, put you know, and there are many other reasons why I chose that title, but yeah yeah david yeah. thank you, that, thank you so those much. are awesome awesome words they really are um thank you for being amazing in all you've spoken to us last night even if it wasn't recorded and <laughs> now uh thank you for being with us thank you for um standing up and being counted in so many different ways we are so so grateful for you uh, here you. at hdc we love you um we are thankful to god for you uh, you're an amazing friend and great fun Aww. to be with as well so huge huge thank you to you um uh, in a moment, I'm just going to ask you to pray for everyone who's listening to this, uh, and then I'd love to pray for you. Um, obviously, this isn't the sermon that David gave last night. Uh, if you'd like to listen to a sermon, if you're wanting more, um, we'd encourage you to head to uh, Church of the City, New York, uh, their website, John Tyson's Church, uh, where David spoke there. How, many, uh, how long ago was that? About a year ago? Uh, three, two or three months ago. Oh, it was only two or three yeah. months ago. Time flies and having fun. <laughs> uh, uh, um, um, two or three months ago, and you can listen to a similar sermon there uh, from a few months ago. But um, do you want to pray for people listening to this? I'll pray for you. Yeah. And is there anything else you wanted to share before we, before we wrap up? I think one thing yeah, I'd say on. is I really would like to say send this as a message um, to the bishops yeah, cool. and just say, I don't think you've done the work yeah. and I don't think you've listened yeah. and I think you need to repent. Yeah. Um, there is such a radical calling here that is so beautiful mm. and not standing with that yeah. is grievous. Yeah. And I think I feel very much a grief for God. Yeah. You know, everyone's always talking about everyone else's needs. What about God? Yeah. Like, what about how he feels? Why is God not being <laughs> put first in his own house? Yeah. It's, just, it's incredibly strange. It feels as if the Church of England has become a secular organization. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to not become that. Yeah. And that doesn't mean we don't have gracious yeah. space, you know, for yeah. people like myself. But we call them to this path. And so that, that's my message. And um, I just want to say that prophetically here, standing on... Wilberforce and yeah. you know on the word and authority of the word. So. Thank you. That's a great message. It really is. There was a, a general synod that I was at. There was one moment where um, one individual um, she was speaking and she misquoted um, one John chapter four mm. um, verse. Just finding it now. Uh, verse sixteen. One John four sixteen, which says, "God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them." Mm. And she misquoted it and said, "It said, love is love." Whoever lives in in, uh, in love loves lives in God and God in them, and that's the, that's exactly the battle that's going on that you just yeah. said there. Actually, who's listening to God? And so often, what's been happening, and what we've seen in some of, some, with some people in General Synod, uh, is they've been going actually. Love is love. Love defines what love is, and I just make that up. And it's how I think and what I'm feeling and what I'm loving in my experiences, rather than saying God is love and He defines love and how that works it out. And um, that's something of the battle going on. And I think yeah. if we don't define love according to Jesus, yeah. then we don't have a gospel. The other thing I'd say is we have a theology of love that is deeply impoverished, yeah. and we need to do work on our theology of love yeah. um, as Anglicans. So but that's another that's conversation. Another, we'll have another, another conversation later. <laughs> um, thank you. Why don't you pray yeah. for um, everyone who's listening to this, Great. and then I'd love to pray for you. Thank you, Jago. Yeah, Father God, just thank you. I just thank you just every time I open your word, Lord, it's just such good news. <laughs> Uh, 
It's so amazing. And Lord, we've been so impatient with you. And so we just repent for our lack of patience, of trusting you that your word is good. And so Lord, I just pray, especially for HTC, but all the churches across this nation and particularly in London, Lord, to just look again, to have that new naivete about your word, to be charged up with the goodness of your word, your holy word, that people gave their lives for these scriptures and they have brought huge transformation and liberation over and over and over again. And Lord, I just pray your word would be read again and that the drought of your word in this nation would be pushed back. And Lord, I pray for anyone who's listening who may be from the LGBTQI yeah. plus community, I pray you would encourage them, Lord, to refuse the false ideological um, responses to this that take them away from that tension and tell them that that is actually faithfulness to resolve the tension. But Lord, you would help them to live in the tension, all people <laughs> to live in the tension. And Lord, that you would tear down the idolatry of romantic love in the church and return your calling of celibacy to the center again and uphold the depth and beauty of marriage as you truly teach it in scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for David. Uh, we thank you um, for who uh, you have made him to be uh, in your image, mm. uh, a wonderful man. And we praise God. We praise you, Lord God, for him. We thank you that you have raised him up as a preacher, as an evangelist, as a writer, as an academic. Uh, but above all, we thank you that you have raised him up uh, to be someone devoted to you and um, loving you. And Lord God, uh, we thank you for his ministry. And we pray that you will continue to use him in mighty ways. Mm. Uh, we pray, Lord, just as we pr I prayed for him last night, uh, where uh, you, Lord God, spoke to Abraham and you said, I am your shield, mm. your very great reward. And we pray, Heavenly Father, uh, that David might know you mm. uh, as his shield and his reward. Mm. That he might know you as uh, his protector, his shield. That he would know that hedge of protection around him from you. Uh, that you would protect him in all that he is doing. And he might know you too as his very great reward, his provider, mm. uh, that you might provide for all his needs at this time. Uh, Lord God, please, by the power of your spirit, mm. uh, would you fill him up? Uh, would you protect him and provide for him? Lord God, we pray. And we pray all this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.